Hi, I'm Art Bergeron, uh, and welcome to this uh, seminar, which is part of the series that I've been doing now for several years. Uh, and this one is all about taking care of the kids and the grandkids and the issues that come up often when I talk to people when they're trying to think of all of that out. So we're really talking about now uh, what would happen after you died. So uh, as you know, I always talk about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Uh, and you know, they, when they were younger, they, weren't, they were concerned about this, but not as concerned because they know that when one of them dies, everything is simply going to the other. Uh, but in this presentation, that's happened. In this presentation, Frank has died. Uh, and so Mary is, or Frank has died, or they become divorced, or, they, or for whatever reason, Mary is now single and is trying to figure out what would happen to her assets after she dies. So the first question, of course, that I talked to Mary about, if we were talking about that, would be what are the assets? So in this case, Mary has a house, it's worth about $400,000. She has a cottage worth $400,000. She has an IRA worth about $300,000, savings worth two. They have total assets of a million three. So for many people uh, here in, uh, in uh, the Metro West area where I live, uh, they have a place at the Cape or in Maine or in New Hampshire. So the issue of the cottage is really common. For folks that I see on the islands, I, I, the other place that I work is on uh, Nantucket and on Martha's Vineyard. Their house is the cottage. Um, they're living in it now, but they're assuming that when they die, the kids will, many of them will have an interest in keeping the cottage. So it's relevant really to all of these people. So the question, we have, there are a number of questions um, that, that Frank and Mary, that Mary would face in this case. Um, by the way, let's start off with, well, what if Mary has no will? She may be coming in saying, oh my God, I really need a will uh, in order to deal with all these issues. So let's be clear, first of all, what happens if she doesn't have a will? If she does not have a will, um, then her assets will go through probate and the rules of intestacy will apply. Those rules say that if she dies and she has no uh, husband, uh, her assets will be divided equally among her kids. Uh, if one of the children has died, then that child's share will go to that, that child's children. Incidentally, uh, in a little quirk of the law, if two of her children have died, then the assets that would have gone to those two children will be equally divided among the grandchildren from those two children. They don't simply go according to um, if you have one child who died with three kids and one child who died with two kids, everybody gets pooled together. There are, there are now five grandchildren who died and things get divided equally. But the bottom line is that's, a, that's an unusual case. Uh, any grandchild who is under age 18, the assets will be given to that child's guardian, uh, typically that child's surviving parent, um, until that child is 18, at which, at which point the assets will all be divided up. If there are no children of Mary, then when she dies, all assets will go to her siblings or to her nieces and nephews. Note, nothing will go to Frank's siblings or Frank's nieces and nephews. By the way, one important thing here is to note is that whether or not Mary has a will, all of these assets will go through the probate process. And we'll talk a little bit more about probate later on. Um, so now we're gonna talk about dealing with problems. Say for example, that you wanna deal with the daughter-in-law that you really never liked. Um, and maybe that's Peter's wife and they're, they've, you've, you've never really gotten along with them anyway. Uh, maybe there's a potential divorce in the offing. You really don't know how the stable a relationship is. But in any event, you know that if you die and leave um, Peter's share to Peter and Peter dies the next day, chances are the assets are going to go uh, to this surviving spouse. So if you're concerned about that, especially if you're concerned about that divorce case, then you really, want to, you really want to think this out. So when you're thinking about that, you need to understand that, that for, first of all, the issue of how these assets would be treated in a divorce is, is state-based. Every state has different divorce laws. So if you were concerned about this, you'd want to make sure you knew what the laws were in the state where Peter lived, so that if there were a divorce, that's the, those are the rules that would apply. In Massachusetts, the rule is that if there is a divorce, assets get divided equitably, not necessarily equally. They are equitable, but not equal. It's an important distinction. So judges have a, a great discretion when they're looking at the total value of the marital assets to say, well, you know, maybe we really want to kind of benefit 
one party more than the other in the asset distribution because one of the, one of the, the, uh, the parties has more assets that are coming from a family that might be coming from a family. That's a real issue. So when you're thinking about how to deal with this issue, um, you want to be thinking about how accessible these assets might be to, in this case, Peter, if there is later a divorce. The, the reason why I mention that is the issue is not necessarily whether they simply, the assets simply go to Peter, right? Even if they're in trust for, P, if, for Peter's sake, there may still be an issue. Because the question is, uh, well, among other things, so who is the, the trustee in that case of Peter's share? Is it one of the siblings? Does, this, does that sibling have complete discretion to distribute assets to the, to the beneficiary at any time? Um, and are there any caps on the amount that can be distributed? Because to the extent that there's complete flexibility, a judge may say, well, yeah, the assets are in trust, but you know, not really, because the, the sibling is simply going to distribute all the assets to, the, to, the, to Peter. So in that case, if you're concerned about this, you may want to put some kind of cap on the distributions that might go to Peter following your death. Um, you might want to name a professional trustee instead of a sibling. Or you may want to name the grandchildren as the beneficiaries because if the assets are being allocated, um, the, 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 the fact that assets are going to go directly to the grandchildren is probably not going to affect that allocation. So there are a number of issues that you want to be thinking out. So that's one set of possibilities, the issue of the daughter-in-law or the son-in-law that you're really not crazy about. How about the question of a child who has a disability? Say that Paul has a disability of some kind. The question there is, uh, how will a distribution to him affect his government, um, at, uh, the, his government benefits? I mean, it would be a shame to think that you're, you're leaving a whole money to, to Paul and the result of it, of it is that he's no longer eligible for money that he otherwise would be eligible for through a government program. So when you're thinking that out, you really want to, you need to think that out asset by asset uh, and program by program. So the question is, if, if Paul has a disability and is on a government program or might be on one, what are the rules of that government program? For example, I, I often have the situation where, where uh, parents will tell me that, oh, my child is disabled, he's on SSDI. Uh, SSDI is the program, or Social Security Disability Income, is the program that is designed really to help people who, who because they no longer have the ability to work full time, can't really wait until they retire um, before receiving some kind of benefit that allows them to continue to live life. So SSDI is based on this assumption that you had worked, uh, that you earned a given number of, that you worked and, and contributed into the social security system for a given number of quarters, works just like regular social security. Um, but that after that, for some reason, because you had an accident or for whatever other reason, uh, you became totally and permanently disabled. That's the definition, totally and permanently disabled. If that's the case, then social security through SSDI will pay you a regular check until you become uh, 65, at which point you'll switch to the regular Social Security program. The point though is that you get that check no matter what your other assets, no matter what your other assets, and no matter what your other unearned income. So if Frank and Mary, or if Mary decides that she wants a, this share of the assets to go in trust for, for Peter's um, benefit, right? Um, she doesn't have to impose any kind of limits on the amount that he can get. Similarly, she can simply give the assets to Peter um, because there is no asset limit and to the extent that he's getting income from any of, the, any of these assets, there's no problem with that. Mass Health, on the other hand, that is the, 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 in, the in, medical insurance program that is really designed for poor people, does have an asset limit cap. So by leaving assets to your child who is on Mass Health or who may need Mass Health in the future, you may be making him ineligible for that program. In that situation, you probably want to have, leave those assets in trust for his benefit. Supplemental Security Income, or SSI, which is often confused with SSDI, is a program not designed for a disabled person uh, necessarily, but designed for a person who is simply poor. 
and the point of the program is to supplement your income up to a particular minimum amount. And those minimum amount, amounts are really small, typically less than $1,000 a year. And to the extent that you leave, the, and this, this is an asset-based program, so that to the extent that the recipient has, has more than really only a few thousand dollars in assets, um, that person is ineligible. But it's also income-based. The point of the program is to supplement income up to that magic number. So that to the extent that, the, that there is a, a, a guaranteed income coming from someplace um, that will cause him to get to that number otherwise, um, um, he's going to be ineligible. So you really need in that case a, a what is often called a supplemental uh, needs trust. Um, you need to give the trustee, probably typically the trustee in that case is the sibling, you need to give the trustee the discretion um, to distribute assets to the beneficiary. There are some limitations regarding the kinds of things that the money can be used for, like even, even housing or food. Um, and then if you're trying to structure something for Paul's benefit in this case, or the, for the, the, the benefit of your disabled child, you need to figure out where, where, the ex, where the remaining money will go after that child dies. Finally, there's the more general, oh, you know, <clears throat> I have a child and he or she doesn't have a disability, but they're kind of a mess. You know, they're, 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 they have creditor problems, they don't pay their taxes, you're just con or they just don't have, they don't have good skills managing money. So in that case, you may want to specify that those funds are going in trust for that child's benefit. It has been my experience that in that case, the, the other sibling is often not the best beneficiary or the best trustee, because typically in that family situation, there's been tension between the sibling who is kind of a mess uh, and the sibling who is irritated that the other sibling is kind of a mess. And you probably don't want to deal or, or, or set up a situation where your death causes actually increased friction among those siblings. In that case, you really want to, may want to consider naming somebody else as a trustee, naming a niece or nephew, um, naming a good friend. You can certainly name a professional trustee, but, but why pay the money? You, the person that you, you want to name a trustee based on how much you trust them. You don't need that person to have special um, uh, legal or financial expertise. The trustee, in that case, could always hire the, the expertise. What you really need is the trust. Finally, in that situation, as in, the other, in Paul's situation, you want to make sure that you've dealt with what would happen to any remaining assets after that child has died. So, in addition to issues involving the children, sometimes folks uh, want to talk about dealing with the grandchildren. Sometimes they want to leave money directly to the grandchildren, uh, perhaps to pay for college. Uh, oftentimes, um, grandparents are contributing to so-called 529 plans. The point of these plans is that the money that you put into them, while, that's, while, it was, while you had to pay tax before you put the money into the, into the fund, the, in, the interest or, the, or the, the income that is derived from that fund is not taxable to you unless you withdraw the funds, because you retain the right to draw, withdraw the funds any time during your lifetime. And then if the funds are ultimately used to pay for the, child's for the grandchild's education, then those funds are not taxed to you at that time. Um, in, instead, they, are, they can simply go directly to the college or university, uh, or high school actually, where um, that, ch that child is going. Um, if you're thinking about doing this, you, 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 you want to think, though, about the effect that those funds are going to have on that child's college application. Um, we, we always refer to it as the so-called FAFSA form uh, that any parent uh, will tell you that they've seen before and that they kind of dread filing. Um, the point of the FAFSA form is to allow colleges to evaluate um, how much student aid um, the child might be eligible for and how, many, how much the child can afford to pay for. In, in, evalu in that evaluation, each col college um, sets its own criteria, but it is not uncommon that, that 529 money uh, or um, uh, money that, they, that the child just has, that they inherited, even if it's in trust for that child, will get um, will get applied to how much that child can afford to pay for that child's education, dollar for dollar. On the other hand, if you simply leave those assets to the, to the 
to the uh, parent, right, as a, or to, uh, of those children, to your children as opposed to your grandchildren, in that FAFSA application, the FAFSA will look at the assets of the parents but will typically only attribute a, a percentage of those assets. Uh, and, and this percentage also varies by college and it, depend, it varies depends, depending on which child this is, whether this is your first child going to college or second or third. Um, they'll only attribute a percentage of those assets to the, the potential uh, use for that, for that child's education. So you may want to think that out before you, you try to figure out how that, how that is going to work. Um, finally, there's the question when money is going to the grandchildren. We talked about this earlier. If one of the, the, the your children were to predecease you and money were going to the grandchildren, of who manages that money and until what age? You can pick any age at which the grandchildren would ultimately be able to receive the money. In the meantime, though, typically you'd have a trustee for the benefit of those grandchildren. In that situation, we often uh, recommend that one of your other children be the trustee for the benefit of those grandchildren. Uh, it has been our experience that otherwise you may run into the situation where your, de your deceased child's uh, spouse ends up remarrying and suddenly there are money, there are funds available for some of her children and not for other children. There, there can just be problems. So typically in that situation we recommend that one of the other siblings or, you know, if you don't think that that's going to work, another family friend or another relative act as the uh, trustee in that situation. Um, so the question then, once, you, once you've figured out what the issues are regarding giving assets to your children or giving them to the grandchildren, is what the vehicle will be through which you can make that happen. There were, there were really three basic ones. Uh, one, you can have a will, certainly, and the will in the, in the case of the examples that we just gave may have trust provisions in them dealing with either the children or the grandchildren. Or, you can have your assets held in joint ownership with somebody so that upon your death the assets instantly go to someone, presumably one of your kids, uh, will often have that occur that uh, uh, someone will say, well, I'm simply going to leave all the assets to one of my kids and I trust them that they're going to deal with all this, right? Or you can, as an alternative to all that, create a revocable and amendable trust. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later. So first there's the 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 quickest, the least expensive um, way to handle these issues as far as you're concerned is that, and that is you would simply have all of your accounts, for example, in joint names with one of your kids, like we're, we'll take in this case Peter, because you're trust and put your house in joint names with, with Peter, put everything in joint names because you're trusting the fact that if you die, Peter's going to take care of all this and he's going to distribute the assets. There's no problem with structuring things that way uh, since the, the the, it, the, contrary to popular myth, there is no gift tax. So if you, if you simply leave everything to Peter and then Peter turns around and gives the assets to his siblings, um, it, that, that's not going to impose a gift tax on Peter. The receipt of a gift, just like the receipt of an, of an inheritance, is not income. And so it's not going to change the income tax situation for any of your kids. That all works fine um, unless, there's, unless it doesn't, you know, unless there's a problem. Uh, because First of all, you are now counting on the fact that Peter is going to do all this. And he may, right, or he may not, because once the assets are his, he has no responsibility to distribute them to anybody. Um, also, going back to the case of the daughter-in-law that you don't like, if the assets are now his, that means if there's a divorce, those assets are in play. All of the assets are in play because he owned them, even if he subsequently gave them away, a court could say, well, you know, you could have kept those assets. So, so there can be problems with that situation. That's, this plan works the best if you only have one child. Um, the second possibility, of course, is the will, that you simply take all of the rules that you've now discussed and figured out and you, and you put them all in your will. Now, and, and that all works. That all works. And assets will be distributed according to the will ultimately, after the assets have gone through the probate process. The issue with that, though, is any asset that you own simply in your own individual name has to go through the probate process before the asset can be distributed. Um, so oftentimes I'll hear, well, I have a will and so I don't have to go through probate. No, that's false. Um, as I talked about earlier, a will determines where your assets go. If you have no will, then the assets go according to the rules of intestacy that I talked about. If you have a will, then they go according to the terms of your will. 
Before any assets can be distributed though, they have to go through probate, which means they're subject to the claims of creditors. And creditors in Massachusetts, this varies a lot by state, creditors in Massachusetts have one year from the date of death in order to file a claim against the probate estate, which is why probate always takes at least a year. This is not because your lawyer is being lazy, it is because we all have to wait to make sure that there are no creditor claims. Now I know you're gonna say, but I don't have any creditors. That's not the point. The reason why the law is there is to make sure that even if you forgot some creditors, uh, or even if they show up as a result of your death, you got into a car accident, you died, somebody else got hurt, there's going, these assets are going to be available to creditors, right, during that one year period. Actually, from the creditor's perspective, that statute of limitations, that period during which a claim can be filed, actually is shorter than what they would otherwise have been allowed. If you had gotten into that car accident and died and hurt somebody, if you were still alive, that person you hurt would have three years in order to sue you. They would only have one year from the date of your death in order to sue the estate. The point is though, from the perspective of your kids or your grandchildren, um, that year could take a long, be a long time. The other issue is, of course, that, that going through the probate process involves legal costs. Uh, our experience has been typically between three and ten thousand dollars, depending on the complexity of the uh, of the uh, of the nature of the assets, the complexity of the situation, and to the extent that there are disagreements among the kids, that's the place where those dis disagreements can be fought out in court in public. To the extent that you're concerned that somebody may contest any of the things that you have said, therefore, you really want to try to avoid the probate process. Third possibility is a revocable and amendable trust. What does that mean? Revocable means whatever you put into the trust, you can't take back out of it. Amendable means, as the name implies, that you can amend the trust at any time. It becomes irrevocable and unamendable when you die, because at that point you can't take anything out, and of course you can't amend it. So you could take all of the rules that we had just talked about, um, and put them into the trust, name yourself as the trustee of the trust while you're alive so that you can retain complete control of all of these assets while you're alive, but then specify who the successor trustee will be following your death. Uh, typically that will be one of the kids, although it can be anybody that you want. The point though is that the day after you die, that successor trustee can then step in and deal, and deal with all of the, issue, all of the uh, distribution of all of the assets. There are immediate distributions, much less likelihood of an argument that leads to a court case. Finally, there's the cottage. And we talked about the fact that, you know, whether you are, live, live around Metro West and have a cottage on the Cape, whether you live on Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard, and therefore the kids really want to keep that house following your death, um, you may have a desire to keep those wonderful times that you have at that cottage going for the rest of your life. What you don't want is to cause your death to be the cause of friction among your children or grandchildren. So in that case, you, you kind of have two options regarding how to deal with the cottage. Uh, one is you could try to figure out now what the rules are going to be regarding how that cottage is going to be managed. It has been our experience that if you figure out the rules, you're the parents. So no matter how, what the kids think about how you set up the rules, they're gonna abide by the fact, hey, this is what my and dad wanted. We may not like it, but it's what my and dad wanted. But in that case, you do need to figure out the rules. There are not an infinite number of rules that you have to figure out. It has been my experience. There were about 60 of them. When, when clients come to me with these kinds of issues, I send them this list and I say, figure out all of the, the answers to, these, to this list and you've pretty much covered everything. But to, to give you some sense of what those are, say that you've got a cottage on the Cape or on, the, or on one of the islands. First, the first question is, everybody gets to use the cottage, but when? Typically in, in chunks of a week. Well, what's a week? Does a week start Saturday? Does it start Sunday? When does it start? Who and, and, and then who cleans the cottage between the time that one is finished and the other one has started? Who figures out the budget? Who's gonna pay the taxes and the insurance? And, and when, when are those bills due? Who collects all that money? What happens if somebody doesn't pay? Uh, and then, how does it all, what, what happens if somebody wants to buy out because they live on the West Coast and they're never gonna be coming to live here? What happens at the end? And how does the end get determined? There are a number of issues that you probably need to decide. Then there's the simple way, the nuclear option. You say in your will or in your trust, 
if, if the kids have figured out um, within six months of the date of my death, how other, otherwise how things are gonna be divided out, fine. Otherwise, the property gets sold and the proceeds get distributed. Um, we, um, we've talked, we, we're gonna talk a little bit about avoiding the estate tax. You can avoid the estate tax by simply giving away things before you die. There are some disadvantages to doing that. Uh, I try to cover that more thoroughly in my presentation on estate planning for seniors. Um, the main thing is that the goal of all of this is to figure out how you can get a good night's sleep. When you die, you're not gonna be worried about your assets. If you're worried now though about how things are gonna get distributed, figure out a plan and make sure that that's the way things are going to be and then get a good night's sleep. If you have any further questions on any of this, you can always reach me by phone. It's 508-860-1470 or email me. Or you can see this presentation again on Frank and Mary's YouTube um, um, page, which is Elder Law Frank and Mary. Thanks so much, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.